So you've heard so much about data modeling everywhere that it is important if you are a data engineer. And in fact, I've kind of unintentionally created this little mini series. Uh, I've got two other videos that you may have seen. If not, uh, you can watch them after this video where I kind of give an intro to data modeling. We talk about important concepts as well as go over things like back tables and dimension tables. And now we're gonna continue in this mini series to talk about historical data or how to actually model data for history and why it's important. But before diving in, hey everyone, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, AKA the Seattle Data Guy. As I said, today we're gonna to be talking about data modeling, specifically discussing things like slowly changing dimensions and other methods to essentially capture historical data. So let's dive in. Recently, I also saw that uh, Zach Wilson uh, put out a video where he also discussed a few other videos, in including tables such as cumulative tables, uh, which is another way you can definitely model uh, historical data. Uh, but we're going to be not talking about that today. Uh, we're going to be talking about facts and dimensions. So if you're thinking about historical fact data, generally speaking, fact data really, at least the way you might be thinking about it, is already kind of capturing historical data, right? Because you're capturing events. So let's say you have this fact table here, right? Uh, you might have a date uh, date or date ID here so it can connect to a date dimension table. You might have an event timestamp to like actually capture the actual timestamp of when it happened. You know, maybe it's a user, maybe it's a customer purchasing a product and uh, then you have some other dimension IDs. So actually let me change this to customer because I think that'll be more consistent. So, you know, maybe you're talking about a customer buying a product. And then every event that occurs, right? You can think of that just as like an insert insertion. As much as that's this process, I am just viewing this as a row. So you can just, you know, this is event one here. So this is, you know, customer one, uh, event one for them. And then you're just gonna keep appending to that, right? Like it's just gonna be in a appending, appending situation, right? Okay, there's event two. Now you've got another maybe customer data, uh, another customer ID coming in and it's their first event, et cetera. So historical data is captured just by the data being in a row state. And we are gonna talk about a different way you can capture kind of this event data uh, at the end of this video. So don't think that's the only way you can essentially capture things like fact data. There's at least one other way that I've used. And again, we're just talking about ways that I've used. I'm sure there are other ways people people have used, but this is what I've seen. I've seen across uh, dozens of companies and, and, and used successfully. So now quick pause. This is actually Ben from the future. One of the things I realized uh, as I was talking about fact data, you know, saying all that data just kind of comes in and you append it. Uh, honestly, it can really depend on how the data comes in. For example, I worked at a company where we would have to append data at least in a few different ways because there's the easy way, which is just appending it. So every new event uh, you get, you just append it. Sometimes this even takes care of things like reverse outs or, or kind of when you maybe have something like a return or maybe if you're like in healthcare, maybe one of the bills was disputed. So you have like a negative $50 on that bill. So you'll actually get that appended onto it. So that's one way where it's like everything's appended. You could just have a replacement. So sometimes you might have the same ID. So there might be whatever that event ID and a new event ID might come in and that might actually just fully replace the prior one where you delete the old data. Instead of minusing $50, it's just the new amount that you now owe or, or have to spend for whatever it might be. Again, could be healthcare. So it is important to note that Although maybe how it looks like in the table might always look the same where it's just a bunch of events in a row, how it gets inserted can vary uh, and will change how you actually develop your system on the other end. So just wanted to have that quick caveat. Now we can jump back to uh, past bed. That's kind of how you can think about fact data. It's very straightforward in that manner that it's, you know, as each row comes in, you're capturing fact and information. You're not losing it. That's the key is you're not losing it. Now the problem is, let's say you have got another dimension table. Let's put together a dimension table. So let's say, uh, usually I think a good one is like dim customer. Uh, it looks like they're doing this way. So I'm just going to stick with this way. Dim customer, you know, you've got customer ID, you know, city, let's say city where they live. That's going to be a bar char of some kind, maybe date created their name, right? I mean, then you can just ignore this last one. So I'm just going to remove that. So. And actually, these would probably be swapped. So now you've got this uh, dim customer table. And if we were to look into this table, so let's, you know, dive in. So let's say you've got this table, right? It doesn't have all the columns, but we really just need a few to show you the example. So you've got customer ID, customer name, and city. And this is really all you need. 
So what you'll have happen here, right, is ID one, customer name John, and they live in New York City, right? Uh, just for the example, we'll do the other one, Jane, uh, Seattle. So we've captured this data, right? We've pulled this out from the database and this is how you currently model the data set. You've got customer ID, your name and city. The problem occurs that at some day in the future, this customer will likely move. So now let's say John also moves to Seattle. So now that they've moved and you would like to maybe answer a question for management, let's say they ask a question like, you know, how many uh, sales are we getting from our customers that live uh, essentially in different areas, right? Like let's not consider where stores are. Let's consider like they're doing this by customer. We wanna know how much uh, different customers from different states purchase from our product. Now, uh, when you do that report and you write that query, see uh, this customer's data, John, will now go to Seattle, right? It's not going to be captured that this customer uh, lived in New York. That you don't have that anywhere. This, this table cannot capture that information. And so you've lost where they have lived in the past. And so you're losing information. I mean, so this is where you actually have to think about how you model historical data. And so when you hear slowly changing dimensions, what that really is, is you trying to capture and model change over time of these dimension uh, data sets. And in general, there, there are a few different types of slowly changing dimensions. I've gone over them in the past. This is arguably, this is just switching, you know, switching from Seattle to NYC or NYC to Seattle is arguably type one. Generally speaking, I really have only seen either type two or kind of type six, some level of type six. I, I don't think I've ever seen it perfectly implemented for, for type six, which means uh, that type, essentially, you could just think about it, that this would have at least two more columns and we'll just add one more row, for example. And you've got your start, basically kind of like a start effective date. They might call it effective date or something like that. And then end date, I'm just doing this to simplify it. So what that will do is, you know, for that NYC, you'll actually capture where that person stops and starts essentially when they live here and when they live somewhere else. So 2023 at one, and let's say they end at 2024. Let's make this easy on me, a 101. And then when you end up re-adding in this data, you'll actually add a new row. So this started, let's say 2024 and then this will be null. And again, you'd have the same thing here where since this hasn't changed yet, they'd be null. So what this does is actually capture dimensional data um, through history, right? So as, as things change, uh, you know you should only pull data where there is essentially a null end date. So when you write this query, you'll say select from dim customer where end date is null. So you only pull the most recent uh, information. So you're not getting, you know, all this historical duplicate data. So that's one kind of part here with this rule. And then if you are doing something where let's say you're trying to report historically, you might actually add in this missing data, right? John, when he lived here in these various places. That way, when you join this data, you're gonna do something where you do a between and likely you end up joining it uh, here on the date field. So in between, you, you consider all those purchases for that specific user in that set of dates so that it doesn't get confused. So that when you pull in city for that specific user, it's correctly um, being used. And then obviously you're gonna have a bunch of duplicate fields, but each of those should be for the specific events. So now you're going at the like sales uh, level versus the customer level. So you're gonna have multiple instances of John, but in some cases, John will be living in New York City. And in other cases, they'll be living in Seattle, which would make sense, right? Because when they moved, you don't wanna report that data uh, moving forward, but you wanna make sure you accurately report the past. Now, this is just one way essentially to capture this specific data set. Um, I say that because at Facebook, we actually did it slightly differently. Now at Facebook, what we ended up doing, so this is again, this is one way you can handle your data slowly changing dimensions. But at Facebook, the way we ended up doing it, let me just get a box. I just want a box, so let me get this. The way we ended up doing it is you could kind of say, let's say, I want to change this over here. So this was essentially uh, just a partition where somewhere in a folder, this was essentially a file somewhere that was like 2023 01-01. So on this date, we had all the data. We just took a snapshot of all employee information at that time. So let's just say 2023. And then again, this is kind of a, a folder system. So you can think about like above this is like some folder called employee somewhere because it's in like a hive uh, meta store somewhere because it's in an HDFS folder system some, somewhere. And then essentially what you can think from there is that each one of these then had, you know, for every date that continued, you would just have another one. And we would just store all the data. So each of the, you know, this would be, this first one here would be all the data 
snapped on that day, took a picture of that specific day. Uh, so with this one, right, like for O2, that's how we, we would capture that data, and O3, that would be that. So let's say it's all employee data from that specific date. Now, part of this is possible because storage was rather cheap, and this kind of could make it somewhat easy for analysts, right? Because what they end up doing on the query side, so let me just take a little here, is they do something like select, you know, obviously don't do select star, but we're doing select star for the example, uh, select from uh, employee, and we had a macro that essentially, let me just pin this over here, uh, where we would often call it DS, was kind of your standard on every table, had it, and we had a macro that would essentially be that you could use. Um, there's a few of them, one of them which is basically your current DS, but I don't remember if it's, I don't think it's current DS. I don't know what the macro was. Someone who works at Facebook maybe commented below. It was, it was something that basically said today's date, um, but you could also use uh, your own macros in dashboards. So let's say, for example, you, you ended up having to join this to some other table, join trying to think of a good table that would be here you know what, let's do um what would you do like employee learnings because there's like a learnings table of like like the courses you go through internally so you know l whatever you join this on both employee id uh you know l dot employee id you can be mad at me for doing a one letter uh alias later uh and you have to join this on um some sort of like whatever the current ds was right you want to make sure you weren't going beyond that um, so e dot ds equals uh, l dot ds and then maybe you had a uh, dashboard kind of filter here so literally it would go back it would automatically populate hey we're looking at you know 2023 0103 and so as it went back and proliferated through this join right like it would automatically look at e dot ds let's say and when it did this join up here right it would only pick one of the dates automatically right like so lds is only going to pick one date so you're not going to get duplicate data you're only going to get let's say again 2020 this data set here uh, and then only the learn data from that data set, if that's your goal, right? Like that, that might have not been your goal. This is just an example. Um, and that way you could kind of have your own historical approach, right? Like, well, now if you want to filter to a different date, you just filter it to a different DS, right? Like as you're kind of looking through this uh, overall report. That still was sometimes difficult to use though, as you can imagine. Like, let's say we're kind of looking at this example here again. Uh, and you're instead wanting to think about like when employees change roles. So instead of this, you have got employee ID, name, sure, stays the same, role is probably the difference, right? Like maybe they're a data engineer here, maybe this is another data engineer, and this is now like they become a project manager. Now, one way you could do this, obviously, right, is um, have uh, hundreds of, of, of data partitions and you have to figure out where exactly that changed, right? Like, do you wanna figure out, let's say like, a count of how many days are in between someone switching roles at Facebook, like the average count. It's going to be really difficult to, to kind of calculate here. You're going to have to like do a lot of manual things where really all you'd have to do here is uh, do something where you say, you know, from this employee table, uh, count the number of days in between here, and then you can figure out the average from there, which would be far more straightforward than trying to go through all these partitions. So we actually still ended up needing to create this. Um, I often find you still sometimes need to make some of these tables where you're like, oh, this, maybe this other method is more performant, but sometimes you have to still make this trade-off where you still end up making this, this specific slowly changing dimension table to capture it because it, it just is more succinct. Like instead of having every date partition ever, even though we did have a certain retention period, 90 days was like default. So this data would generally be deleted after 90 days, but you've got all of that data or you could just have, you know, essentially two rows and that's all you really need to know about John, right? You don't need 90 days of data. You need two rows um, of, of, of data. So we still often sometimes switch to this when required. That's just something I like to compare against like, you know, Yes, you'll see certain things done at larger companies, and there are other benefits that we'll, we'll talk about here um, in terms of like why a company might do this. There are performance reasons. It can be, it's easier to query, right? Like instead of having to do this between thing, you can just write, you know, tell me what the current data is. And oftentimes that's what we really cared about was like current data. Um, also when data gets really big, sometimes you don't want to store as much and you just want to store like the current date and you don't necessarily want uh, a large data set. And that's where I'm going to go into the next example. For that, I'm going to go to Roblox. They covered this really well. So one of the examples we talked about was fact data, right? And one of the types of facts that you might try to capture is something like page visits, like how many times people visit a page. Um, maybe you want to capture how many times they visit that page in a day, right? You've got, let's say six or seven or eight or a hundred uh, page visits in a day. And that gets really big, right? When you think about like Facebook, you could have millions of visits in a day and over time, that's going to get very, very big. And maybe you want to be able to query that data very effectively 
but still be able to talk about historical data, at least in an aggregated fashion. So as you can see here, like you can almost view each of these moments almost like a user. I'm just gonna treat this as like how often someone maybe shows up to the website on that day. And this is already kind of uh, aggregated as well, but you can imagine like there's maybe five visits in a day on some very, very granular table somewhere. And that's gonna be very hard to query. It's gonna be very big. It's gonna be very expensive. It's gonna take a long time, especially if you only wanna look at a specific subset of users. So another way you can do this to model it is like, hey, if we already know you're gonna filter by users, why not create one very wide table where you create what we often reference as a date list. And so there's a few different ways you can do it. Some people will implement it using kind of bits, so zeros and ones to kind of define often if someone showed up. But I'll, this is another way where you can use a dictionary to say, hey, which days people show up and how many times did they show up? So that way, if you want to have, you know, a billion users, but you really only want to pull out a specific set of them, right? Like maybe you're only interested in US data at a time. You can one, really quickly get that. So you're not having to go through, you know, billions and billions of rows just to pull all that data back. You just have to go through however many billion people there are on your, on your service, so two billion, which is not that big. For, for data sets versus, you know, as you can imagine, if you've got 2 billion users, the amount of data that that has for events is huge. You've now shrunk that down uh, to as at most three or 4 billion rows uh, to filter out, and then you filter that, that, filter out what you want. And then on top of that, uh, you have all your data kind of nicely aggregated um, in a date list. So you can already just say, hey, now go into that field and tell me how many visits for this section of time, right? You see they've got first and last date for this section of time, did someone show up to our site? So it just drastically changes the way you kind of track this event data. This is generally more pertinent to companies with very large data sets, right? Like, cause this does add a technical bit of complexity, right? You could argue that this might be simpler to query for most analysts. Whereas now if you have a dictionary, you have a little bit of extra layer of technical complexity. So it is this trade-off where this is very easy to query. Like, hey, I just wanna see, you know, certain dates, a certain date range and, you know, some this field, but at a certain point, there can be, you know, this need to essentially have summarized data. That's one reason you might see this data model this way um, to track historical information. It also can lose a little bit of information in this in this manner because, you know, you're not getting as much granularity, but again, there's pros and cons to, to both um, approaches here. So hopefully that's helpful for those of you who are trying to understand how to model historical data. One, we've hopefully gone over why it's important, right? Like you'll have reports to do. It helps you add a little more context. It helps ensure that you don't lose information, but also there are reasons in terms of performance that you might model your data differently. Like half the reason that I think we do slowly change dimensions is because you used to have limited space and you couldn't just do, you know, every date partition. And so as much as it seems like, oh, that's very easy, just take a snapshot every day and capture that information. Not everyone can afford that. Not everyone has in unlimited compute and storage. And so it's really important to always make sure your data model doesn't just fit your needs in terms of business needs, but also your technical needs. You can't store uh, infinite data on-prem generally, unless you are a large company that has their own internal cloud, like Facebook. But hopefully that was helpful for all y'alls. Um, I went through a few different ways you can kind of store historical data. And with that, guys, I'll see y'all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.